Hi, everyone. Welcome to Food Talk Live. I'm really excited to talk to our guest today about the issues of defining what sustainable and healthy production and consumption looks like and how we can urge farmers, business governments, and eaters to adopt policies and practices that are good for people and the planet. The experts we'll be hearing from today are part of the Global Action Platform on Sustainable Consumption and Diets. The platform convenes stakeholders working on food systems transformation to work toward collective impact. They believe that only by connecting agendas on biodiversity, climate and health and other key issues can we achieve the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And they warn that if we fail to act on food and agriculture, and specifically consumption and diets, we will diminish our chances of success on addressing any of the other crises we face, whether again, it's climate, biodiversity, or inequity and discrimination in our food and agriculture systems. And full disclosure, Food Tank is a very proud partner of the platform and pleased to be hosting today's discussion. Now, it's my honor to introduce our guests. First, we have Brent Locken, who is the global food lead scientist for WWF and an expert in food agriculture and nutrition. Brent has a broad background in, conversation, in conservation and also conversation, I'm sure, and is working to improve planetary and human health through sustainable consumption and diets. Next, we have Stinika Onima, who is the first executive secretary of UN Nutrition, which is a UN interagency coordination and collaboration mechanism for nutrition at the global and country levels. Stinica is a nutritionist and agricultural economist focused on placing health and nutrition at the forefront of sustainable development. And we have Federico Bologna, who is a high level champion for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or COP26, which will be in Glasgow, Scotland, the United Kingdom this November. He works to unlock the potential of regenerative agriculture systems and food in addressing the climate crisis. So welcome to all three of you. I've been so looking forward to this conversation. So, so thank you for being here. Thank you, Danny. So Brent, I, I wanna start with you and really discuss a little bit more about the Global Action Platform on Sustainable Consumption and Diets. And if you can also sort of interweave and describe why 2021 is kind of the super year of food. Yeah, thank you so much, Danny. And it's so great to be on this panel with everybody, friends and colleagues, you know, you know, so we've heard so much about food, right? And we've heard so much about the fact that food is this like critical link of so many different issues. It connects uh, health and biodiversity loss and climate change and water use and everything. Um, it's taken us a while to get here, but it's it's uh, really great that the world is finally waking up to the fact right. that food is this is, is, is this critical centerpiece of so many issues, and we're not going to be able to solve them unless we fix the food system. So that's good. Right. Um, it's great that the UN Food Systems Summit uh, had the first summit last week. You know, I think that was a very, very positive step. Sure. However, what we realized, <clears throat> you know, probably, uh, you know, last probably April and May, was that regardless and despite the fact that we are starting to finally wake up to the fact that food is so important, it's still not being discussed at the highest levels. Right. Right. <laughs> it's still not being front and center of all the critical policy discussions at the climate cop, the biodiversity cop, the land use cop. Um, we give a nod to it maybe, but, but it's still not front and center. So what we wanted to do with this action platform was say, you know, how do we bring people together? How do we bring the key stakeholders together to not only talk about food and right. well, no, we don't want to just talk about food. We want to focus on the action. So let's figure out how do we come together? How do we focus on these key summits that are going to take place within the coming months and work together to amplify food systems and their critical importance so that we can start to influence some of these processes moving forward? Sure. So, and why the next, uh, you know, six to 12 months are so critically important because it's, it's, it, it, it's, you know, I think it's one of the most important times facing our species. You know, we've got sure. this peace going on. We had the UN Food System Summit last week. We've got the critical climate COP coming up in only six weeks time. We've got this biodiversity COP where these biodiversity goals are going to be renegotiated for the planet in terms of what we want to do over the next 10 years. We've got the land use COP, which is, extremely critical, leading up to Stockholm plus 50 in June of next year. So we have a key, it's a key moment of history of saying, if we want to really 
uh, realize the potential of the decade of action, it's now. Right. If, if there's now a time to have sleepless nights and to work <laughs> 24 hours a day, which we're all doing, it's now because we have to be able to mobilize and raise this issue at, at each one of these key platforms. Right. So what, what the action platform does is it brings together key stakeholders to organize uh, events, op-eds, live casts like what we're doing right now to raise sure. this issue, to get more people on board. And, uh, um, it, you know, we've got great partners, wonderful partners. We sure do. Brent, I, you know, the urgency is so great. I, 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 I think the, the sort of elephant in the room is why aren't key stakeholders taking on food and agriculture? Because, because it does affect all the things we're talking about, whether it's the climate crisis or biodiversity or nutrition or anything else. Why haven't we, why haven't we realized until now that food is so important? I don't know. If, if yeah. I yes, may, you have a good yeah, let, me, let me step in here. I mean, I I think this this has to be a joint answer. But bringing in the nutrition perspective, um, looking at nutrition in the past and also up until now, nutrition is seen as a health issue. Right. Completely separate from sometimes even agriculture, but definitely from environmental issues. Right. But now I think um, we are also in the midst of a nutrition year of action. So now we have the attention of nutrition policymakers, nutrition practitioners. And we, I now I say we as a nutritionist, we see we have huge problems billions of people who cannot afford a healthy diet, billions of people who are malnourished, one out of three people in this world is in fact malnourished. And that's huge. That's, that's right. too big of a problem of a challenge. We compare that with the environmental issues, the climate issues, the biodiversity loss. And we, unfortunately, we, we can join hands with the hugeness of the, of the problem. And because these problems are so big, I, I think now people slowly are starting to see mm. this is something we need to solve together. And when you dig down a little bit in the nutrition problems and the health problems we are facing right now, we know that food is the problem. Diet is the problem. Diet is the major problem, the driver of the, of the majority of the, the burden of disease we are facing nowadays. When you dig even further down, you see that diet is also driving many of the environmental problems. So that that is slowly now settling down finally sure. this year, thanks to the huge, let's say, attention through the Food Systems Summit, for example. But now I think we need to keep that momentum, bring it to the, the Climate COP, the Biodiversity right. COP and all these other COPs, but also keep that food system momentum on the radar up to the nutrition summit nutrition for growth summit later this year in december because then we, we as nutritionists should not go back in our health silo right, but keep right. the radar open keep the windows open to all these other stakeholders and sectors that are relevant to our joint problems absolutely this is really about breaking down silos connecting dots which we've all been talking about for years and so I'm wondering, maybe take a step back, if all of you can, and really explain for our viewers and our listeners how sustainable consumption and diets are linked to biodiversity, climate, and, and, and food security and health. Because I don't think everyone understands this. So we have this opportunity, right? The urgency is there. But can one of you connect those dots? How are, or you know, maybe Federico, you can connect the dots about how these things are linked to our climate crisis. Sure, happy to. Uh, and I'm sure there's, it's so interlinked, as, as Danica and Brent has said, that there's more, but I'm coming at this primarily from the climate perspective. Um, today, I think we know diets globally um, are really not diversified. We've come to rely on maybe, uh, you know, out of the thousands, maybe five or six thousands of edible species. Uh, we're only really using 200, but then only about a dozen make up seven uh, Seventy percent of what we actually consume, uh, and those, not surprisingly, are the major drivers of things like deforestation. So, uh, you know, uh, soy, for example, palm oil; those are two two big culprits. Now, when you look at it from the perspective of food, nutrition, everything that we consider wholesome diets, it, you know, you don't eat soybeans, you don't right, uh, right. drink palm oil, those are all processes in an industrialized system. 
uh, that has been characterized by being very extractive. I often say that it resembles more like mining as a business right. model than actually uh, uh, creating nutritious food that we right. need. And that is a serious driver of all kinds of um, uh, problems for us. It's uh, food is uh, behind six of the nine planetary thresholds that uh, the famous Johan Rockstrom study talks right. about. Uh, here's something that makes me think um, about how interconnected these crises are. Um, in a relatively industrialized nation, such as the one that we might be in, to put 1,000 calories on your plate, it takes anywhere between six and 10,000 calories, mostly in fertilizer, but also refrigeration, transportation, sure. all kinds of things. And all those calories are mostly fossil fuel calories because we still don't have that many renewable energy sources in right. the world. So you can see how what we eat, the problem with emissions uh, and how we grow what we eat is all interconnected. Right. Uh, right. And so when you look at sustainable food systems, you see that they're much more localized, they're much more diversified, food doesn't travel as much, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to occupy so much territory, so it's not so bad for biodiversity and so on. So it's a systemic transformation. Uh, and that's something that we have a hard time uh, governing ourselves around. Right. A lot of rules have to change for that to right. happen. That's why it's so hard. But Absolutely. You know, Go ahead. You know, just to build on that, Federico, I mean, you know, one of the things that... Um, it seems to be easier to talk about sustainable production. It seems to be easier, easier to talk about regenerative agriculture and food loss and waste and those sorts of things, right? And sure. it feels like those issues are, are, are really starting to gain traction. But healthy and sustainable diets is something that's much harder for people to talk about. And especially policymakers at the key summits to be able to address. Um, we talk about nature-based solutions. But the thing that we need to wrap our heads around is the fact that even if we implement the most innovative, regenerative agricultural practices, if we don't shift consumption patterns, we will still drive land use change. We will still drive greenhouse gas emissions. We will still drive biodiversity loss. So therefore, that's why, you know, and what we're saying within this platform, which is so important, and all of us are saying here, is that we have to talk about both things at the same time. It's right. actually across the food system. It's, you know, what you were saying, Stineke, we have to start, get out of our silos. We have to start uh, joining hands and nutritionists and environmentalists. We have to start coming together to talk about these issues. And, and uh, it's very comfortable, you know, within our silo. Um, but the only way that we're going to be able to tackle this is, is, is really for us to come together. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I, preaching to the choir hasn't uh, really gotten us where we need to go. So we need to get out of those silos for sure. You know, Federico said something very interesting about local and regionalized food systems. And Brent, I know you wrote in a recent article that that local food production is not always more sustainable. So I'm assuming that, you know, uh, you, you have some thoughts on that. It's, it's received a lot of attention, that piece you wrote. Um, and, and I'm wondering if, you know, perpetuating this myth of, of local from your perspective, is, is causing harm? What I'm adverse to are panaceas or simple solutions. And I right. think that we tend to want to um, latch on to something that's going to save us, whether it's uh, local solutions are going to save us or organic is going to save us or uh, um, regenerative agriculture now is going to save us or technology is going to save us. And, 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 and what I push back against is I say, it's, it's always context dependent yeah. and it really depends upon, right. I mean, there are many countries in the world that can't grow their food locally. What do you do in a place like Saudi Arabia? What do you do in a place like Nigeria <laughs> where, where, where producing local food might not be an option and, 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 or all the local food can't be produced locally. Right. So, so, so what I was saying in that piece is that in some cases, if every single country starts to internalize their food system and say, we're going to produce everything locally, it can actually have adverse impacts. It can drive up greenhouse gas emissions. It can drive up biodiversity loss. And we have to, therefore, step back and say, we live in an interconnected global food system. We have to start working together more. We have to start breaking down borders. Right. Um, and, and we have to figure out that we live on one planet. That's, that's a very scary concept in the world that we live in, um, especially now, but, but, um, but we're not going to be able to solve it otherwise. 
Yeah, I mean, we need systems thinking. We there's there's no silver bullet, obviously, and we need more place based solutions and systems that can really address these problems in different ways. Uh, Stina, I you know you, you also wrote something recently uh, uh, in an op ed that you co authored for the Global Action Platform, and and you write that issues of food security and environmental sustainability are trapped in a vicious cycle where unsustainable Production increases uh, the speed of environmental degradation and environmental degradation weakens our ability to produce food. And so I'm wondering if we can sort of, you know, turn that around. What's the positive angle on that? How can improving access to nutritious and healthy diets that are affordable contribute to ending this vicious cycle that we're in? Yeah, thanks for this. I, I just wanted to make that point when Brent started speaking about the systemic change does it that is needed and how what can be an entry point to do so um i think that sustainable and healthy diets as we started the conversation with is such an entry point it's all about the system but it's all about people as well about consumers and consumption um so if we find a way to to um facilitate and to stimulate people to eat healthier, then we can have a double duty action, as we call it. So an action that is positive for our health and an action that is positive for our nature, for our environment, for climate change. Why I'm saying this? Because globally, we have started to eat more and more, for example, animal source foods. We, have, we are not eating enough fruits and vegetables, plant-based foods. So there is, if we would follow the WHO guidelines on healthy diets, we would in fact save lives because we are healthier and we would prevent that many greenhouse gases from being emitted because we would eat overall a little bit less uh, animal source food, for example. Sure. So that, that would have a huge beneficial impact on, on both sides of, of, uh, of the coin. And um, I, I don't want to say here that we need to put the burden now on an individual, individual consumer to, to say, hey, uh, my dear, you are responsible right. for all the problems in the world because it's still a systemic problem. Right. We need to change the system. But we as governments, we as producers, we as producers organizations, consumer organizations, um, policymakers, but definitely also investors need to start investing and preparing policies in such a way that are beneficial for sustainable and healthy diets so that we can make that shift to health towards healthier people sure. and healthier planets. Sure. So Stinega, you know, a healthy diet is going to be different in every in every culture and every community, what that looks like. And I'm wondering if you can sort of, you know, th there's no again, there's no one size fits all approach. But what Definitely what not. are we looking for here? So we're looking for more plant forward diets where, you know, uh, meat is not the center of the plate. What else are we looking for? Plenty of fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds moderate amount of, of, of uh, fish from aquatic sources or aquatic foods, I should say, not just fishes, um, limited amounts of, of, of meat. And these are kind of global rules. But as you say, it's so important to look at the context. Uh, when I say, for example, limited uh, amount of, of meat, of red meat, I know people will start complaining. The people, for example, that have a stake in eating higher amounts of, of, of red meat. Sure. But let's say um, in some places in the world, it's better for your health to limit a little bit that consumption. Whereas in other places, like low income people, um, the poorer population in some places in Africa, vulnerable populations could benefit from eating a little bit more animal source food. Right. I would never ever say this kid should not eat an egg. That sure. would be definitely harmful so we have to be very very balanced with our um with our uh, messages also that's great i, I want to get to this uh comment I build on that just oh, very quickly because i think what stineke just said is so important is because so often this conversation gets co-opted and it says you're talking about healthy and sustainable diets means no meat right. and then it just shuts down conversation and i just want to make it very clear that 
no, nobody's saying this. Healthy and sustainable diets is eating within a, th a certain thematic pattern as you know, Steneke outlined. And that means that in some cases it's lowering meat consumption. In some cases it's increasing consumption. It could right. be up, up upwards of five servings of meat per week coming from a variety of sources, fish sure. and, 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 and other things. So I we think need that to... variety, that's the key word. We right, need yeah. diversity. We need variety. We need biodiversity and we need diverse diets. Yep. Sure, if we forget absolutely. about diversity, also contextualize diversity, we, we're out. Diversity is key. Absolutely. Federico, I'd love you to, to jump in here and talk about regenerative systems and the, the you know, bringing more diverse diets together to, to solve our nutrition crises and our climate crises. There's, there's so much to, to respond to, absolutely. And uh, I just want to echo what Brent was saying. You know, when you see silver bullets and one size fits all solutions, you know that that's a slippery slope. Right. Uh, I can, the problem with meat, there's a famous saying, it, it's not the cow, it's the how. So it's how that meat was sourced and right. produced. Mm -hmm. There's even cases of regenerative grazing that are actually mm -hmm. carbon negative. Uh, you can oh. produce beef meat in a way that sequesters carbon. Is it, a, exactly. is it a silver bullet that will save us from climate change? <laughs> Absolutely no. Uh, so again, it's, it's, it's really uh, highly context dependent. Now it's interesting to look at the link between nutrition, wholesome, rich diets, and how you might actually produce them. So research from uh, a very famous project called Drawdown, which a lot of us uh, may know about, they looked at how many tons of carbon per hectare per year a certain regenerative practices, forms of production can sequester. Right. So most of the regenerative agriculture commitments that we're seeing from a lot of corporates, which is good and welcome, sure. they're normally around annual crops. Right. So uh, cereal, uh, uh, wheat and things like that. Uh, that's all good. But the sequ sequestration potential is very low. Mm -hmm. In fact, all that's doing is keeping the soil there, which is great. We're losing a lot of soil, but sure. it's not going a long way in terms of sequestering. And it turns out that that's a lot of cereal and a, a diet based on a lot of cereal. You can quickly understand that it's not very good for you. On the other end of the spectrum, when you look at agro uh pastoralist systems, which is combining trees with, uh, with annuals, with right. animals in highly dense and diversified uh, plots, not only gives you a lot more variety, it makes the producers a lot more resilient to shocks because now they have different crops. Right. Uh, it actually sequesters 15 tons of carbon per hectare per year, 15 times more than an annual, right? That is a big ticket when it comes to actually fixing a massive problem. And while I agree that we need to be careful with uh, silver bullets, there's one thing we all need to get right, which is staying within 1.5 by 2050, which right. is the goal of the Paris Agreement, because that's like a threshold criteria. If we don't make that, everything that we're talking about here will be harder. Absolutely. So uh, anything that will get carbon out of the atmosphere and into the soil should be highly, highly, highly prioritized. And conveniently for our topic here, it usually means agro silver forestry or agroforestry or intercropping and all the good ways to produce food that are contextually dependent. So for me, regeneration is about looking at these win-win-win right. scenarios, right? And nutrition is, and health, they're such a, such a, a what do you call it? A, a, an indicator, a complex indicator that they just tell you that everything's right. Yeah, when you're healthy, when nutrition's good, a lot of things are going for you. Absolutely. Does anyone want to comment on, on Federico's comments? You sure, Brent? Other than it's, it's I mean, I mean spot on, 100%. Um, you, you know, one of the things I just would like to say about regenerative agriculture, given the fact that it's, it's, it's getting so much attention at the point right now, Federico, is the fact that when you look at the literature, there's no consistent definition of what regenerative agriculture means. And at this point, we have to start coming together to really define it. You've got one group that says regenerative agriculture is about organic. One, one group that mm -hmm. says it's about carbon. One group that says it's about biodiversity. One group that says it's about nutrition, right? Mm -hmm. and, and at some point, we, you know, we, we have to be careful, especially with regenerative agriculture, because it has so much potential that we make the house bigger 
we start to define it and 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 we start to make sure that it doesn't get co-opted by any one group right um, right um, so um um totally agree with everything that you said uh you, you know it just kind of comes back to this thing is it's not so simple and let's not simplify what the definition of regenerating right. culture is right because I, I, I agree <laughs> and if, if i can riff on that um right. Part of the the non systems thinking kind of reductionist mentality, it's that search for that term. So tell me, you know, is it nature positive? Is it regenerative? Is it organic? Just give me that one thing that I can focus on. This is very cultural. I mean, it's been hundreds of years of industrial revolution, where we we've maximized for productivity. It's the way we get taught in school. It's it's our literature. It's in our culture. So it, it's a really massive change that we have to do. I get a lot of inspiration from indigenous communities who, for all kinds of reasons, they have not been so educated into such an industrialized or mechanistic paradigm. And lo and behold, they tend to be good natural stewards of their land because right. they have oftentimes an, a learned ability to maybe handle more than one variable, yeah, to do the Absolutely. yes and instead of the either or, or to not blow up any one product in detriment of the others. So it's very much a culture of uh, stewardship, uh, of interconnection, of um, creating, I think, from our culture, the, the instruments to be able to account for these context-dependent, multivariable results. Absolutely. Uh, and later, perhaps, I can give you some examples of how that's happening with net zero or with true cost accounting, which I think are sure. very important to sustainable consumption of diets. Why don't you dig into that right now, Federico? And, and before you do, I, I just want to say that recognizing indigenous practices is key to all of this. Recognizing and honoring them and, and you know, making sure that they're they're included in, in what we're talking about here, I think is, is of the utmost importance because they've been left out of so many conversations. But this true cost accounting angle, Federico, I, I think is so important to what we're discussing because it does help break down silos. It does sort of bring all of these issues together um, in, in a framework of sorts. Absolutely. I, I'm happy to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, so there's a study, uh, I think that was by the Food and Land Use Coalition, which many of you might know. Um, and what they've concluded after some economic modeling is that the food industry, as we know it today, it's probably worth about $10 trillion a year. Just that's counting all the transactions in that food system. Uh, but the interesting thing is the proportion. They say that for those 10 trillions a year, there's one, there's 12 trillion in sunk costs, sure. right? In stuff that happens, usually not good, uh, that somebody will pay down the line. It, it's not included in that right. price. Like the health and that impact. somebody, the health impacts, the biodiversity, the water pollution, the soil loss degradation, because when, when I go to the supermarket and buy my things, all of that is not included in that price. Right. So they're getting a huge, I mean, that is a hugely wasteful, wasteful system. And somehow what we're not seeing is, uh, yes, there should be companies that are profit driven and there's an increase in standards and how they can do that or organic or, or all kinds of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, traceability and transparency is sure. increasing. Uh, so th that's all good. But somehow the public benefits of producing and consuming mm -hmm. food in a healthy way can't entirely lie in private hands. There are also public benefits. Absolutely. So cleaner water. I mean, all of that should be paid, you know, with my taxes. So the farmer who has been asked to perhaps farm differently, he should be paid for it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and not all of it from the private uh, dealer that he's buying to, but perhaps right. also from our tax system. Because sure. we want that biodiversity. We all benefit from biodiversity, that clean mm -hmm. water, in many places, there's cultural landscapes. In Europe, for example, when you drive in the countryside, that's all maintained in a way that's inherent to, to their culture. Right. So the public-private finance aspect of this really needs to step up. And those are things like uh, food bonds, for example, procurement policies, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine if in a country like the US, for example, where I'm based now, all hospitals, the military, government buildings should only source regeneratively or healthily produced food. Right. Think of the massive market signal that would send to all kinds of producers. Absolutely. Or if schools did it, you know, if, you know, if all restaurants in one particular community did it, it could have such a huge impact. 
Right. So there's at least a dozen existing financial instruments that we can use. And there is a network working on this. It's called the uh, Good Food Finance Network. Right. Um, they're working on this to see how a government, for example, um, might uh, uh, procure uh, food bonds or, or um, you know, implement these right. um, instruments that will actually make the private public finance equation work. Yeah, such a good point. Brent, you look like you were itching to say something while Federico was talking. No, disagreeing. Right. Yeah. I was actually sitting here reflecting, thinking to your first question about why we started this platform, right? Yeah. And this is it. We're we're coming together to have this conversation. And we we wouldn't have come together to have this conversation if we wouldn't have started this platform. And sure. at the start of this, people kept on pushing. What do you want to get out of this? What what are you going to do? What is your goal? What is your goal? We want we want right. to get under a single goal. And we didn't know. But it's these sorts of conversations of being able to sit here and listen to Steneke and you know Federico and have them, you know, just riff it with with all this expertise is is just fun so i i, Absolutely. I, I have nothing to say other than this is this is just nice to hear everybody talk yeah. I, I just I wanted agree. to jump jump in there as well what what federica just mentioned about the 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 public financing is also a tool that we from a nutrition point of view really really favor and stimulate we, we have beautiful examples in the in the world of, of school uh school meals and school sure. feeding especially homegrown school feeding where you can you know stimulate so many objectives into one package, uh, locally sourcing, uh, facilitating a small farmer production, sustainable production, a diverse production, diverse production of healthy uh, meals that can be consumed by children. You know, right. it's like end, 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 yeah. end. And, <laughs> and that's the win exactly that we can also, we, I'm learning every day uh, from the people in that platform. And I can share back like the examples I I may have uh, in the you know in 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 related areas, and that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I find it is beautiful. One of the things that I was excited to see come out of the UN Food System Summit, you know, lead up and the summit itself is a coalition around school meals and school feeding that I think will be really beneficial in terms of what we've been talking about procurement and really involving so many different um, stakeholders on, on these issues in, in really uh, different ways, because we, we all have something to contribute. Uh, Stenica, I, I want to go back to something that you mentioned before, um, that you said food is the, pro you know, the problem to so many of the issues that we're talking about, climate, biodiversity, etc. But in so many ways, if we flip that around, food is also the solution. And, and I'm wondering if you can reflect on that a little bit. Yeah, I think I, I, I even started reflecting on that a little bit earlier. I mean, that promotion of sustainable, healthy diets, diets are, are you know, that's food. Food is in the diets. That is really, that could be that that win-win. If we were able to convince producers, consumers, policymakers to facilitate, to stimulate, to, to help consume sustainably and healthy, that would really be the solution that, that right. then food is a solution. And it's not like, so follow those guidelines and, and the tool for it, uh, Federico already, already mentioned financing, public and private financing and, and how you can steer, uh, steer the wheel, flip, flip the needle, however you like to call it. And there's other tools as well. That's called food based dietary guidelines. And, by stimulating, preparing those, you bring nutrition back to food and to agriculture to right. link it with production yeah. and, and what you eat instead of just looking at the health sector. I mean, right. health is extremely important. Health sector is extremely important for nutrition, but we need to link it back to what we eat and what we produce. So food-based dietary guidelines with sustainability criteria could really be one of these entry points, again, to stimulate producers to produce, consumers to consume, and policymakers right. to make that, prepare right. that policy framework in I, order I, to do I'd love well to jump and in better. There. Of course. Go. So I, didn't, but I didn't mean to cut you off, but it's very compelling. Uh, one of the things that I really like about working on food um, is that all of us eat, better or worse, some of us are fortunate to eat more than once a day, 
the majority of our planet, unfortunately, might not be in that uh, situation. But what I find very compelling about that, that you have a choice. I have a choice. Uh, I'm working a lot on climate, and a lot of the criticism that climate gets is it's, it's a little bit removed. A lot of people feel like there's not much that they can do, that politicians should do something. We just saw Greta sure. go, you know, this is all big blah, 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 and, and there's truth to that. Um, but food, I can do something about. Yeah, you can do something about. In fact, you have many times a day that you can do something right, about that. Right, right. Right. So I think a lot of what um, Stinica was saying goes back, at least for me, to choice. Exercising your choice and making an informed choice. And informed choices is what drives policy in the end, right? So I think that one of the things to look out for and that we're going to see more of, and I welcome that, is more information and more traceability. Sure. Uh, with the advent of information technology, I'm expecting that it will be easier to make informed decisions about what you consume. And that's your activism. You know, if you worry about biodiversity, then look at what you're eating because somewhere down the line, I am driving it. You are driving it. Right. It's just that it's, it's been, and the yeah. same thing goes for nutrition and health. It's just been very hard to, to visualize all the connections and mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. the interrelationships. And that's why perhaps we fall in these one size fits all. Oh, skim me organic. That way I don't have to think about it. Right, right. You it's a little back. harder than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah to jump in I... on this message too, because, you know, this is so important. And this is why I started to work on food. I used to work in Borneo. I used to live in Borneo. I used to work on orangutan conservation and cloud leopard conservation, and all the iconic species, right? And people, you know, I mean, they'd often ask me, what can I do to save orangutans? Sitting in Canada or Europe or somewhere. And I struggled. It's like, I don't know, fly there maybe and do something. But 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 it's really hard because it's so far removed what you're talking about, Federico. These issues are so far, you know, you know, it's really hard to tangibly have that impact. But food is that direct link to biodiversity conservation, to nutrition, to climate change, to all those things. Um, and that's what I think is so good about it. And and the messaging that you brought up, Danny, in terms of uh, how we frame this, I think I think we have to turn it from a problem into a solution. Yeah. We have to frame it in a way which is positive. We're not taking away meat. Right. We're introducing more fruits and vegetables. That's right. the positive side of it, right? We're not taking something away. You know, so how we figure out the communications angle of this and the and the and the, and the framing of this, I think, is going to be very important moving forward. And the last point I just want to make here is. We also don't want to put all the emphasis and um, responsibility on the consumer to make these choices, right? Right. The power is on their plate. They can make these choices three times a day. It's an amazing thing that gives us agency, but we also need to team up with governments. We also need to be able to create the food environments where everybody has access to this. Right. Um, and, and if we don't do that, uh, then, then it, it will continue to be something that only a small segment of the population can have access to. Absolutely. And, and I think yeah, on this traceability point, on the power of the, the plate point, we have this new, these new generations of consumers who are coming up, young people who really want the story of their food. They want to eat food that they feel good about uh, in many ways. And while they might not be reducing uh, their meat consumption, according to a recent WWF report, they do care about where their food comes from. So we have a real opportunity here for them to drive change and you know, not just vote with their forks, but vote with their votes for the kind of policies and practices they want to see uh, coming about. Uh, you know, uh, the, I, I think this is a question for, for everyone. Um, our, our current production practices have focused on yields and calories. And, you know, uh, and, and as we all know, there's more than enough food and enough calories to feed everyone who's alive today, plus probably a, a billion or two more. Um, uh, we haven't fo focused on actually nourishing people. Um, and so I, I'm wondering, you know, what is the role of organizations in the global north to, to go, you know, to go back to what we were talking before about the, the role of indigenous practices and, and cultural practices that are uh, sustainable and but they've been historically marginalized and, and sort of, you know, uh, put down. Uh, you, you know, we often think of the foods like millets and sorghums and some of these fruits and vegetables we're talking about. Uh, as poor people's food and, and not as the foods that are really of the future. How do we, we, we recognize and honor 
those the people and places and cultures that have contributed to the you know keeping those foods and stewarding them. That's a. It's a big one. Yeah. That's a big question. I don't have a simple answer for that. I don't know. That's I mean, we definitely have to. I, I, I'm sure Steneke, you've got quite a bit to say on this, but we have to get away from producing four main crops. Yeah, um, diversity we, again we, is is yeah. key acknowledging the diversity that is out there, building on it, make use of it, and acknowledging people have different traditional diets. So, you know, not, I'm not saying now that traditional diets are per se better, or there's sometimes even negative health impacts there, but acknowledging that diets are different and that people value food in different ways, that, that it's part of culture. And that value that people give to their food needs to be acknowledged and need mm -hmm. to be brought back where it is not there anymore because there's so many people at least where i where i live that are disconnected from the food or at least disconnected from where the food comes from sure. and that is something we should should we should work on and if i may i'd like to make one more point um about yes we do have a choice we can vote with our fork and vote with our vote but we should also not forget, definitely not forget that this moment, there's 3 billion people out there who do not have a vote, yeah. who do not have access to healthy diets at this very moment. They simply cannot pay for it. They cannot afford right. it. And that, again, brings us to these systemic solutions that we need to work with governments. And, and definitely, right. we also need to mobilize people. That's why we have this action platform. But we need to gear up towards these, these COPs that are upcoming, these summits, uh, mobilize policymakers, mobilize investors to invest right. differently, not just in the three crops that are out there, or that, that we think are the only ones, but in a broad variety, diversity of, of crops, because we need to make sure that all people, 7 billion people, have access to healthy diets. Sure. It's so important. I might have just uh, two anecdotal uh, sure. uh, to just to complement this. Uh, one of them is that well, I, I am Italian, uh, and I remember clearly my, about 20 years ago uh, when fast food arrived in Italy. And to my Italian family and friends, the answer was, why would you want to eat fast? Like, why is this a good idea? Right. right. And somehow that's when slow food came up as a movement that we all know about. Because then the link was, you know, this fabulous cheese that I'm going to eat, you know, took three years to make it to my table, you know, and there's value in that. And it actually comes right. from this very specific place that I love that's different from that other place that I also love. Sure. Um, and this was very specific to this culture. Uh, so I think it comes back to understanding food as beyond nutrition. Absolutely. Uh, food is relationships. Food is how you feed your child. Uh, food is your culture. It's food is not a, an objective thing. Uh, uh, food is a, is a cultural construct. Sure. And what we're seeing, um, especially with the way the markets work and all of that, is a certain uh, overdrive of um, capitalism, you might call it, or, or, or an over obsession with uh, efficiency and returns yeah, to the sure. expense of cultural norms, to the expense of people, so laborers. Uh, mm -hmm. We all know, it might be good reminding that 75% of our food is produced by smallholders, uh, okay. oftentimes unassisted by credit, uh, sure. by public policy and all kinds of things. Um, and they're just, they just become cogs in a, in a wheel and labor becomes commoditized. So the real kind of systemic issue at the bottom of all this is a, is a very high premium on returns for a minority. And the way this is playing out is in rising inequality, which then gets to what Sinek was just talking about, poverty, exclusion of people that today can't feed themselves as well as a grandparents could. Right. When they had indigenous feeding systems. So mm -hmm. we, we flipped the thing around and I think the, the big paradigm shifts to go back to something that is more around, more similar to the global commons or, or stewardship of, of more than one variable. Uh, uh, absolutely. We have to go back to- I, I'm gonna jump in there really quickly. Sure. 
Sure. <laughs> There's so much that I think we could, we can say here, and and I know we we might be running long now, but fine. what you just said, Federico, is, um, you know, we tend to talk about dietary shifts, right? We tend to say dietary shifts, dietary shifts, but in some cases, it's not dietary shifts. Just hold on to what you're doing. What you're doing is good. Don't make that shift to some other diet, right? So, you know, hold on to the way that we used to do things in the past, the way that our grandparents used to eat and not to romanticize the past, but to say that they're, you know, we're not talking about dietary shifts everywhere. In some places, yes. In other places, no. So let's scan it. Let's learn from it. Even with regenerative agriculture, a lot of people are doing it right and they've been doing it right for a really long time. We might want to brand it as something new and interesting, but a lot of indigenous cultures would say, eh, well, we, we've known this for thousands of years, right? So, right. so that, that framing and, and both with diets and, and uh, egg is, uh, is important. Absolutely. And I, I love the point about going forward by going back into looking at what, you know, cultures have, have eaten. And so that we don't have those massive dietary shifts that can be detrimental. And I also want to point out something Federico, when he was talking about what food is, food is joy in so many ways. And we have to remember that and that everyone deserves access and, and the ability to afford diets that are healthy, sustainable, and delicious, because that's the point of food. It, it brings us together, but we <laughs> want it to taste really good. Um, I, I want to talk about what's happened over the last 18, 19 months now with COVID and that, you know, the, the, the pandemic exposed many of, of um, the sort of uh, uh, the, the fragile parts of our food system, including long supply chains. And, um, you know, there was this shift uh, among a lot of activists to supporting more regional food systems. But from, from my perspective, and I feel like most of you, we're always going to have these globalized food systems along with regional and localized food systems. How can they coexist to produce these healthy and sustainable diets that we want? Wow, you're really asking. Some <laughs> Sorry, I'm stopping everyone. I feel like I'm talking to the smartest people on the planet, so I feel like more answers. <laughs> I don't. I I I don't know. Um, I do know that um, the global food system actually. There was a recent study that just came out that said that the global food system actually held up quite well during COVID, except for accessibility. Accessibility is the one component of the food mm -hmm. system that did not hold up well. And I think there's lessons to be learned from that. Sure. Um, there are indigenous um, exchanges of food, like up in Canada, where they found that the indigenous communities were not impacted by accessibility and food shortages because they had traditional ways of exchanging food and, and ensuring everybody had access to it. So sure. I think there are lessons to learn from that. Um, we have to wrap our head around the fact that we live in a multicultural, diverse, amazing planet that, that, and, and all of these systems are needed. We can't globalize everything. It, it is. It, it's this, uh, it's the, all these various components, this, this global jigsaw puzzle of, of, of local versus regional versus global. We have to put it together to solve this problem. Um, so no, maybe that wasn't a very satisfactory answer, no, but no, no, uh, it was. yeah. I mean, I think that's the key. There's no simple solution. We keep going no. back to that. We have to keep connecting the dots. Go ahead, Stina. Yeah, I, I just wanted to to build on what Brent said. I, I think um, there is a little bit of agreement and disagreement to what extent the food system worked well. Uh, yes, there were no major um, issues with, let's say, the, the three major grains, the, the major staples. However, the more perishable foods... The, the fruits and vegetables, the, the fish, the aquatic foods, there were really disruptors in the supply chain and there were issues there. And what we do see, what we do see experts um, advised um, in the context of COVID, it's try to maybe not rely on local food system, but localize, more mm -hmm. local. So less global, but more local. And where you see indeed that people who suffered less could rely on more local systems. And of course, that is all embedded in a more global system. But you could see a little bit that um, the advices from experts tend to say a few things. Let's 
rely less on complex, longer supply chain, but more localized systems, um, rely more on diverse systems. So again, do not just rely on one single crop, but a diverse range of crops and products. And what you also see, we did a little bit, bit of a survey, is that people um, fell back more on home cooking, sharing, sharing with their neighborhoods, right. uh, local producing. Um, so, so, of course, we need to see if that sustains in the longer run again. Now, now things are getting back to normal, more or less, maybe a little bit. I don't know. Right. But you do see that people were relying more on their on their locality on their neighbors and a little bit more that social aspect of food was right. highlighted in the response to to COVID-19 but um, yeah I, uh, that's also not an answer but just to complement <laughs> and build on what Brent okay. also mentioned I, I will riff along and I think that's an amazing question um, I was just noting here I think I look back on COVID and three things stand out for me as it pertains to this question uh, one of them I saw, and I think this builds on what Seneca was saying, uh, an awareness and perhaps an increase in efforts to self-reliance, right? All of a sudden we're in a crisis, things we took for granted are not so for granted, and that manifested itself in all kinds of things. Maybe people went out, went out and bought a raised bed at Home Depot and decided for the first time to have their veggies in their lawn or uh, other things like that. So that's a good thing. On the other end, I think we had a first taste of a mini crisis in the big context of things because if you think this is a crisis what's coming with climate unless we do right. something about it right. this would be the new normal uh and one thing in particular is look at the spending that came out so in countries that could afford it i mean in the u.s i think it's six trillion dollars in a loosely targeted nobody did randomized control trials or big <laughs> debates about the, the money just flowed, right. uh, possibly not even in the right direction. Uh, so why are we doing that for a climate? Right, right. Right, mm -hmm. if we, all the science mm -hmm. is there. So there's a cognitive issue there where uh, somehow, you know, that impact is gonna come a little bit later. Mm -hmm. I live in Florida. I've dodged about four hurricanes in the last year and a half. Right. They've literally come a hundred miles to each side of, of where I live and there's more coming. So right. it's given us a taste of our interdependence on, on what a crisis is. And I'll finish with one that I think might be out of left field, but uh, I don't know if you remember the explosion in Beirut. Of course. It blew up yeah. a chunk of the city. What exploded was fertilizer. And that should give you an indication of how much fossil energy goes into making this product it's the same technology we used to make bombs to grow food if, if something isn't profoundly off about that right um yeah. sort yeah. of that that was a, a real bombshell in all kinds yeah. of things. absolutely no absolutely. but that interconnectedness of systems is so huge you we started up yeah covid it it may have not impacted directly of, on some of the major supply chains but when you connect all the dots and how impactful it is and has been on people's lives it is really alarming and a wake-up call what happened because we are now predict predicting models say that more that 283,000 children will die more if we don't step into action because of COVID-19. And that's not just because of the food. That's because health systems are disrupted, economic loss, production lines are dis disrupted, et cetera, et cetera. Schools are closed, no access to school meals. So many bits and pieces that come together and that cause that many additional death, child deaths. That's disrupting. So we really should step up our efforts, I would say, to connect the dots, bring Absolutely. ourselves together, promote good health, co promote good and biodiversity, and, and of course, try to mitigate climate change. Absolutely. Uh, if there's ever I, a time to do it, it's now. The urgency is here. And Brent, I want to give you a chance to talk about 
uh, the Global Action Platform on Sustainable Consumption and Diets and our plans, our collective plans, all of us for COP26 and really bringing food in a bigger way to the climate conference in a way that it hasn't been before to really be disruptive at this, at this global event that brings stakeholders from all over the world to talk about the climate crisis and make sure that food and agriculture are at the center of the debate. So, yeah, so we've got big plans this year, really big plans for exactly what you're describing in terms of what can we do to be able to raise this issue of food. Um, now, we're a bit, little bit late to the game to be able to influence actual policy and negotiations. You know, who knows? We'll see. But um, we're playing the long game here, too, you know, in terms of what's going to happen next year and the year after that. Yeah. But it has to start with raising awareness and getting people on board. You know, so we have multiple events planned over the course of many days with um, many of our action platform stakeholders to say, what can we do both from the civil society you know, point of view to say, we've got to mobilize individuals, we've got to lift people up, we've got to help make them aware of the power that's you know, on their plate and, and the role of non-state actors. Right. Um, uh, we also have events that are planned where we've got the state actors that are gonna come in and say, how do we influence some of those negotiators? How can we have these conversations with them? So it's really that bottom up and top down process to bring people together. We've got great things planned with, you know, Food Tank and UN Nutrition and, you know, others in terms of how do we raise a communications component of this? Cause I think that often the communications component of this gets left over there. Absolutely. And we have to start figuring out how do we bring this to more people? So we've got events planned. We've got live casts and podcasts and, and, and all these things planned over the course of the days. We also have a dinner event planned where we're going to bring together between 80 to 110 people to share stories about food, to, uh, to talk about what they're doing within their individual cities and indigenous communities. And this is our opportunity to bring people from all walks of life together to celebrate that joy of food that, we've, that we have talked about here, to share a meal and to come together to mobilize action. So, you know, we look at what we're doing at the Climate Cop this year as just the beginning. We've got to also do it for the Land Use Cop and the Biodiversity right. Cop, and we've got to do it for, you know, the N4G conference, which is going to be in December. So we've got to do something there leading up to Stockholm plus 50. So what we're hoping is that this is just the beginning um, and we need all voices. Every, you know, everybody's got to really get on board with this. So, and, and we've got the most amazing partners to actually do it with us. All hands on deck. I couldn't be more excited. For more information, folks can go to WWF panda.org to find more information about the the platform they can also go to foodtank.com uh, to find out more information as well thank you all this has been such a rich and uh discussion and i know our audience has really enjoyed it thank you all stay safe and well and I, i'll see you in glasgow very soon i hope thanks everybody thank you bye-bye